The Apostle Paul, when he wrote 1 Corinthians, reminded them that when he came, first came amongst them, that he, uh, he did not come in much strength, but in, he makes the statement, in weakness and in fear and much trembling, and that their faith would not rest in the wise words of plausible speech of men, but in the power of the cross. I share that with you today to say, church family, we are on day 17 of some kind of upper respiratory virus in our house. We have operated most nights on an hour and a half of sleep, and so I do not in any way intend to put in front of you and convince you that today will be the greatest sermon you've ever heard. I have prayed, since we will be true to His Word, that we will all meet Jesus in a very tangible way. So may your faith rest in the power of the cross. I appreciate those of you who've been praying for us and reached out. And should my voice not hold out, uh, Daniel will come lead us in some music and take you through the rest of worship. <laughs> We've been walking through Ephesians, and there are a lot that Paul has said, but as we are particularly in this passage on unity here in Ephesians 4, there is a very clear theme where Paul has, uh, and, and, and by virtue of me saying Paul, truth be told, it's the Holy Spirit writing through Paul. And here's what the Holy Spirit is saying, that God is actively at work in, in our world to this day to bring all things, seen and unseen, visible and invisible, back into proper alignment under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And by alignment, we don't mean that Jesus is waiting to be… He's already Lord, He already has all the power, but that things are, are put in… Are, that, that they come to the place of right submission to His Lordship. And then we're told that Jesus is actively doing this work, filling all things in, in His primary vessel through which Jesus, in which God is doing this work to bring all things under Christ's Lordship is the local church. It's, it's the global church to be sure, but how is the global church actually lived out? In the visible local church. In the midst of this, he tells us as believers saved by grace through faith who make up the local church that we are called to a great calling by His sheer goodness and that the key to living out our calling is to living in a way that we protect and guard the unity of the Holy Spirit without which the world does not see Jesus in us and through us. We protect it by acting and walking with one another in humility and gentleness and patience and bearing with one another in love. And we watched last week as this unity, which is so dear to the heart of God, this unity is played out through diversity. Jesus gives gifts. Part of this gift is the foundational leaders, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers roles that all have to do with the proper proclamation and teaching of the Word of God, the truth of God, the one true faith. And that those, God, God gave a gift to the church in those roles, and, and the gift of those roles were for not that they would do all the ministry, but that they would equip the saints, all the saved in that local congregation to go out and do the ministry because God has also given gifts to every individual believer, gifts that each believer needs to be equipped to put into use gifts that when put into use are to lead to the building up the growth of the body, both the growth from new believers coming to faith in Christ, growth from current believers growing deeper in Christ, that there is a unity which plays out through the diversity of the body, and that when the body grows, what is, what is it all for? How, how long does it continue going for until we all reach unity in, of the faith? All our beliefs are fully in line with who God really is, unity of the knowledge of the Son of God, that our experience and knowing of Jesus Christ is in right alignment, that, that it would be from another vantage point, the mature man, that immaturity would be laid aside and we would be adults, that we would be measured up to the fullness of Jesus, that this unity that we fight to protect that comes about through the diversity of the body is to be this way until each and every local church is brought into conformity to the image of Jesus, which is what God is at work doing. Well, what, what is described then is a unity 
that is played out through diversity that is to lead to maturity. And the question then is, as we come back to Ephesians 4 today, well, well, what will that, and it's two-sided, what will that result in at the same time, not just what will result in, but if it's actually happening amongst us, what does it look like? What does this look like if we are walking in unity through the proper use of the diversity that God has given to our body and it's growing into maturity? What does it look like for you and me? Well, I invite you to turn with me back to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. And we'll pick up in verse 11, and we'll we'll dive deep once we hit verse 14. Here's what it says, that Jesus gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors, teachers, for the equipping of the saints to do the work of service for the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and unity of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ in order that, or as a result, that we might no longer be children. Children. The the literal idea is in contrast to one who is a grown-up who has fully developed powers of reasoning, who has strength, that this is a child, one who is is susceptible to, to the ignorance of immaturity, who is susceptible to the gullibility of immaturity, who is just susceptible to immaturity, the self-centered focus of immaturity, that that the goal of unity through diversity to maturity would be that we would no longer be immature Christians, that we would no longer be Christians who are driven by immaturity. And what does this look like? Tossed here and there, violently thrown back and forth tossed here and there by waves, carried about, pushed along by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness in deceitful scheming." Here's what he says, if if the unity of the Holy Spirit is being guarded by the employment of the diversity of the gifts of the body, and we're growing into maturity, then it looks like a body of Christians that grow up and reject falsehood. It looks like a body of believers, it looks like local churches growing up where they are no longer tossed to and fro, where they're no longer driven by the immaturity of youthfulness, but they grow up and reject falsehood. And look how he describes falsehood. He uses a wide array of of words no longer tossed here and there by every wind of doctrine, every wind of teaching or instruction, that we no longer hear somebody say something. That that Instagram theologian had a really good-looking podcast and said this wild thing which has always been condemned historically in Christianity, but now because it's accessible in a really good-looking podcast, it must be true. We're not to be driven by stuff like that anymore. Every wind of teaching, instruction. By the way, always remember when it says doctrine, or maybe your Bible says teaching, don't, don't forget that teaching, instruction, doctrine always leads to action. Don't just hear this as, oh, this is just, we're talking false theology. Yeah, and false theology, what does it produce? False living. It says every wind of doctrine. Not only that, he describes it in this way. the trickery of men, the cunning, the clever use of ruthless tactics. It was used to describe somebody playing dice games with loaded dice by the cunning, by the craftiness in deceitful scheming, by deceitfulness employed by those with wicked and malicious character and intentions, deceitful, intentional falsehood, scheming, a method, a well-thought-out plan. When he says that we would no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves, carried about by every wind of teaching, by the trickery of men, by the deceitful, and and by the, the craftiness and deceitful scheming, here's what all of that means. It means when you and I look around and we see people taking the Word of God and twisting it 
to justify things that violate the Word of God and the character of God, understand those arguments, those teachings, they are not some kind of, well, we just accidentally fell into it. There is intentional, brilliantly deceptive scheming methods. It has been a well-crafted plan, that false teaching, for the purpose of bringing destruction. That's what those words mean. It means the enemy it starts with the enemy, it plays out through human hands, has put and employed cunning and tactics to put together, to string together a plan to ruin the faith of the children of God. That's why you will watch the first and primary way the enemy will come against the unity of the church is always to obliterate sound doctrine through the twisting of Scripture. It's why when you look at historically, you had people attempting to take the Word of God to say Jesus is not the Christ. Just like the enemy took the Word of God in the garden and said, did God really say? It's why we've watched false doctrine like people taking the Word of God to justify things that violate the character of God like slavery. It's why in our own day we're watching as the Word of God is now employed to say that God did not in fact create human beings male and female, unique and distinct. It's why we're now watching as this election cycle plays out the Word of God being used to justify the slaughter of an innocent life in the womb, which the Word of God never justifies and in in, 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 in condemns in the strongest language. because there are well-crafted. These are not just accidental, well, I misread the verse and employed it. The enemy is actively at work attempting to craft well-reasoned, slippery arguments to trip up the people of God into false doctrine. And by the way, false doctrine is not just on things like that. We see in Scripture, False doctrine was people coming and saying, Jesus is the Christ, be saved, be saved by grace through faith in Jesus, but then your whole relationship with Jesus is built on your own works, the book of Galatians. False doctrine can take that way too, wrong understandings about who God is and how He works. By the way, false doctrine is not only those theological things, false doctrine can simply be that instruction which teaches you and I as a believer that what God is up to is all about us, such that when I believe that, my actions play out, well, when we don't do something where I want it done, when I want it done, in the right time, in the right location, in the room that I want, well, then I'm going to cause a stink about it. That is just as much being tossed to and fro by false teaching that produces false living. And it says that if we are walking, preserving, and fighting for the unity of the church, if we are employing the diversity of God's gifts to us as a church, if we are growing up into maturity, then there is a rejection of falsehood. There is a rejection, a growing out of the ignorance. That's some other reason we fall into false teaching is straight up we're ignorant. And we're ignorant because, well, I don't want to learn that kind of heady information. I just, wanna, I just want something that makes me feel good today and go out. Well, listen, I'm not opposed. The guy's not opposed to anybody feeling good. But if all I want is something that feels good, at some point, I, I got to learn enough truth to be able to combat the unbelievable amount of false doctrine that's being thrown everywhere in our world today. Some of our problem for stumbling is we're ignorant. We got to grow up out of ignorance. Some of it is we're gullible. Well, this guy said he's a pastor, and he said this, so it must be true. We need some discernment. I don't care who calls himself a pastor. Even my words ought to be completely and totally discerned against Scripture. Do they line up with what God's Word says, yes or no? Individualism, maturity rejects these things. And here's the iron. Do you see how the the falsehood is ultimately rejected? We're to grow out of being tossed to and fro. Do you see the connection here? the connection of no longer being tossed to and fro, of growing up out of that, it is tethered to being a part, an active participant in the local body of Christ. Let me put it another way. If you cut yourself off from the local body of Jesus, 
You pursue, I, I, the church is messy. I don't want to be a part of church. There's no good church anywhere in the world. I'm going to do it all on my own. Let me be clear. You are setting yourself up on an island that is at great risk for you to succumb to false doctrine. Church family, are we rejecting false teaching no matter how popular it is, no matter how convincing it may be, or no matter how self-satisfying it may make me feel? Not only are we to reject falsehood, but look in the opposite direction, or not just to reject it, but there's a way to reject it. Look what he says, as a result, we're no longer tossed to and fro, but look at verse 15, but speaking the truth in love, speaking the truth in love, literally the verb is truthing in love. It implies that I am, I am for truth, I am seeking truth, I am living truth, and then there is a special emphasis, which is why you see it translated this way in English, that because I am believing truth and I am living truth, I am, I am gripped to speak truth. That instead of, I'm not just rejecting falsehood, but part of what's enabling me to reject falsehood is I am actively embracing, living, seeking, and I am speaking Truth. I am truthing. Church family, are we speaking the truth? It's interesting when, when Scripture talks about meditating on the Word of God, we, we hear the word meditate and we think, well, let me sit real still, close my eyes, and think hard about that verse. The, the Old Testament idea of meditating has nothing to do with closing my eyes and sitting still. It's quite literally the idea of something being on my lips that I repeat over and over and over again. I am speaking the truth over and over and over and over again. And in that repetition, I am embracing that truth. Speaking the truth. Are we speaking the truth? But notice it doesn't just say speaking the truth. Speaking the truth in love in agape, in that love that is God's love towards us. Love is why I delight in the truth. Love is why I live the truth. Love is why I speak the truth. This is love for each other that flows out of first our love for God, which is dependent entirely on the fact that He first loved us. It's agape love, which is God's love towards us, not on the basis of what we can offer God, but out of God's sheer goodness the value with which He looks at us and, 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 and loves us out of the value He places on, which means this, if you and I are to love each other this way, we don't love each other on the basis of what each other can do for, each, for me. It means as pastor, I'm not to love you as my church family because of what you can do for me. I'm to love you because of the value that God has placed on each one of you. What is that value? He died for you. There's no higher value that God could have placed on you. He gave the greatest gift there is, the sacrifice of His Son pouring out His blood on the cross Amen. on your behalf. It says, it says love is to drive why I speak. Why do I speak truth? Why do I speak truth in opposition to falsehood? Listen, falsehood, it is a, it is a devious, well-planned message designed to ensnare you for the purpose of destroying you. There is no lie that ever leads to life. It only leads to destruction. So if I love you, that should motivate why I speak the truth. If we love each other, it should motivate why we speak the truth to each other. Not only that, not only does it drive our motivation, it also drives how we do it. Now, I'm not saying that there's not a time when each one of us doesn't need a little bit of a firm, uh, a firm knock from a fellow believer. But it is oftentimes, I have watched in the body of Christ as you have people who claim to be believers, and they may or may not be, I'm not trying to make that judgment, but you've got people in the body of Christ who claim to be believers, and you've got a portion that begin to drift into false teaching. And then it seems like you've got a portion, they're going to be the, the bulwarks, they're going to stand against the false teaching, and there is not a drip of love in any way they do it. They're just sitting there waiting for the next person, to, 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 to the next big pastor to show their hand at maybe being a heretic, and boom, the YouTube video's up blasting them. 
Listen, you and I are to speak the truth driven by love, and we're going to do it in a way that is reflective of love. We've already seen that in humility, gentleness, patience. By the way, when, when Galatians 1 talks about how you go about confronting a brother in sin and then walking through the process of restoring them, which that's a pretty confrontative process. We're calling you out on your sin. There's fallout for the consequences of your refusal to repent. But Galatians 6.1 talks about that, that process has to be done. If it's going to be done God's way, it has to be done with gentleness. That without gentleness, it's impossible to restore a brother. You and I are to speak truth and love. So church, let me just ask you a real simple question. Do you love, church, uh, love truth today? Do you love truth? Are you gripped by not accepting anything until you arrive at the truth? Now, not only that, look around the room today. Now, some of you may be guests today, and so I'm not putting this pressure on you. You're going, I don't know anybody here, Pastor. It's not on you if you're a guest. Many of you in this room, you are members of this church. Look around this room. Do you love the people you see? Do you love them? I don't mean that manipulatively. But if we are to be a body, a local body of Jesus that fights to preserve the Holy Spirit's unity, we're going to walk in humility and gentleness with one another. We're going to be patient with one another. We're going to bear with each other's annoyances and problems. Because we actually love each other, we're going to reject falsehood. And in fact, when we see people moving into falsehood, we're going to speak the truth. And we're going to speak the truth because we actually love each other. And the sad reality is in many churches today, we don't actually love each other. And sometimes we don't love each other because we don't flat out know each other. Church family, do you love each other? Do we love each other? It is that love which is to drive. When you look around, do you see people Jesus died for? And you go, wow, this is intense, Pastor. We're to speak the truth. We're to do it driven by love. We're to do it in love. That's really tough. I got great news for all of us, church family. If you've been saved by grace through faith, the Holy Spirit of God lives inside of you. The Holy Spirit of God lives inside of us to enable us to live the Christian life. Do you know what the Holy Spirit of God is called? The Spirit of truth. What is He doing in us? He's convicting us of truth. And the Holy Spirit of God produces fruit in us. And do you know what the first fruit of His fruit is? Love. It is possible, church family, for you and I to be committed to seeking, delighting in, living out, and speaking the truth to each other because we love each other. Oh, may it be. So what does a mature church look like? It's one, it's one which presently and continuously lives in and speaks out the truth of God in love. And as we do this, look what else it says. But speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head, that is Christ. That as we are growing out of the immaturity, which is easily tossed by falsehood, we are, we are driven by maturity, which seeks truth, which delights in truth, which delights in truth for the love of God and the love of each other, that we're to grow up, and we're to grow up into the head. Now there's a twofold imagery here. So what does it look like if a church is walking in unity, through diversity and growing in maturity, it looks like a church that grows up into greater submission to Jesus. Jesus is the head of the church. It's simple. What part of your body gives the marching orders to the rest of your body? It's the head, the brain, the mind. Jesus is the head of the church. He gives us our marching orders. He is the one who reigns over us. He is the one who defines us. He is the one who empowers us. You and I, if we are to grow up as a body into the head, means as a church, we are growing up 
into greater submission, greater obedience to Jesus, which, by the way, inversely means this. If, as a church, we allow disunity of any kind to fill in any crack and persist amongst us, we will not grow up into greater submission. We'll, we'll plateau and we'll stay in whatever level of disbelief we have. Not only this, but the head imagery here is, is not even so much on the head's ruler, but where does your body get the source for everything it needs to grow? Where, where is the sustenance come from? It comes from your head. Now you're going to go, well, there's all these other systems. And yes, but you need water. You need food to live. Where does it come in? The head. If, if your arm gets cut off, and I'm not trying to be morbid today, but if your arm gets cut off as a child, now your arm won't grow back, but shockingly, the rest of your body will grow like normal. Why? Because the, everything the body needs for its growth ultimately comes from the head. That's the drive. It's Jesus. It's Jesus who actually enables us to grow. And so when we walk in unity, when we fight for the, the unity that Paul's talking about that the Holy Spirit gives, when we are faithful to be equipped and to employ the d diverse gifts God has given us, when we grow into maturity, what it means is not only do we grow into greater submission to Jesus, obedience, we also grow into greater dependence upon Jesus, which inversely means this. If we allow any disunity to, to foster, you know what that means as a church? It means we cease growing into greater dependence on Christ. You say, well, why is Christ, why is it so necessary? Well, look, look what it says. We are to grow up into Him who all respects the head, that is Jesus, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, from whom the whole body, according to the proper, powerful working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Why is it so important that you and I grow up into greater submission, grow up into greater dependence? Because it is Jesus who actually grows us both individually and corporately. You want to grow as a believer? You want to grow as a church? It's only Jesus is the one who provides that growth. Now look, when you say Jesus is the one who provides that growth, well, okay, are we we're just… A, no. The, there's things we need to understand. Look what it says. From whom the whole body being fitted and held together. We've seen that word fitted. It's a passive, it's a passive uh, verb, and here's why it's important. You and I don't fit ourselves. What it describes is the fact that Jesus, as He has put us together as a body, He has sovereignly brought believers together for such a time as this to be First Baptist Church Pflugerville, and in each one of us, each one of us have a unique gifting, wiring, ability that God has sovereignly picked. And in His, in, 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 in His fitting us, we have a specific place to play that if, is vital to the health of the body. He's the one who's fit us. He's the one who, in fitting us to take unique places in the body, holds us together. And this plays out. We've been uniquely fitted by Jesus. We're being held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working. Now, proper working is an interesting little construction. The word working, Paul's used it elsewhere, and it has the idea of something not just functioning, but something functioning with every bit of power it needs to do the job. I'll give you an example. Uh, when I was a youth pastor, I separated my shoulder. It was the kind of separation where they looked at me and said, you don't need surgery, but it's going to hurt worse than if you did. It's great. Now, my shoulder, my arm, it still functioned but it did not function with any power. I couldn't even open a drawstring bag without passing out because of the pain. Now my shoulder today, it's got as, you know, it's healthy, it's got power to do what it should do as a shoulder, which is to hold one of my kids and walk them around the house to sleep while they're sick. It says working. It says that God, God has sovereignly fitted each piece together, that each piece 
holds each other. There, there is this mutual tension holding them together in the body, and that it plays out as each part works in power. By the way, when it says works in power, what it means is this. God has, has wired each believer in this congregation with a gifting. With, with, remember last week, grace was given. You have a ministry God has called you to with your life. And for such a time as this, He's brought you here. It means that in Christ, you don't just have a job to do, work, but you have the power to do it. You don't lack what's needed to function properly with power. Not only that, it says proper, it means in measure, meaning that you only have the power to do what God actually wired you to do, not to do what you see someone else doing. I mean, some of us in this room, quite literally, God has wired you to be the greatest encourager in the history of the church. But encouragers don't get as much attention as teachers, and you can spend all your time desiring to be a teacher, but God didn't give you the power to be a teacher. He gave you the power to be an encourager. And I would argue in our churches today, we have a desperate need for all the people who say they have the gift of encouragement to do it, because we're all so discouraged. And by the way, it's not greater to be a teacher or an encourager. It's greater to be faithful. The proper working. Now, church family, understand what this means. As everything works properly in the power of Jesus, Jesus is the one causing us to grow, but we also contribute. We come under what He's causing to do. The body grows. And as each part functions properly, the body grows, and the body grows for love, grows in love, grows more loving with one another. Listen, church family, understand today, you have been master designed by God. Ephesians 2.10, to fit a role in the body of Jesus. Are you fulfilling it? Each believer who is a member has a part to play, and let me be clear, you have a part to play no matter your age or generation. There is a part for the five-year-old new follower of Jesus just recently saved by grace through faith, and there is a place for the 95-year-old who's known Jesus for 80 years. Just because you are old does not mean you get to retire, and just because you're young does not mean you're exempt. You may need to be equipped to fill your role properly. It may be that, that God's got a ministry for you, but you're not quite ready to step in it, and you need to come under the, the equipping of the leadership God's pulling in the church in order to function properly. You will need to trust Jesus for the power to do whatever it is God's made you to do. And you must work in His gifting and not try to be someone else. An elbow should never want to be a knee. If you're an encourager, be an encourager. Administrator, administrator. A teacher, a teacher. Listen, church family, I want to be clear. No church's pastors can do all the ministry, nor does God charge them to do it. God charges us to do the work of the ministry. And notice, it is as each part plugs in and works properly that the body grows, which means this reversely. If in a church there is a refusal to employ what God has wired me and gifted me to do, for whatever reason that may be, it means the body will not grow as it ought. How many churches are there ministries waiting to be started that the people God's called to start them for whatever reason won't just step forward? And so the body is growing deformed. Now listen, I want to be clear. When I say God's called you to a ministry, I don't necessarily mean God's called you to find a spot for a church program. Some of you, God's called a spot to a church. We've got a big thing called Harvest Festival coming up. We need a lot of volunteers for it. But I mean ministry so much broader than just what we do with church programs. Some of you, God's wired to be great evangelists in your job. And you're going to have opportunity to preach the gospel, to speak and live truth to people I might never come in contact with. 
church family. We must take up our place. And as the body grows, Jesus grows the body through the proper working of each part. And as the body grows, it's to grow and function in love. Now, let me be clear on something, church family. As a follower of Jesus, you will never thrive if everything here is true. By the way, that's rhetorical. It's true. God wrote it. And God has sovereignly fit you to fit a place in the life of a local church and that your maturity and my maturity are dependent upon all of it functioning rightly together. It means very simply this. You will never thrive as a Christian if you cut yourself off from the life of the local church. Every one of us as human beings long to belong. And as Christians, we do belong. But too often, the body of Jesus expressed as our local church gets shoved down the totem pole. And it is time, church family, because the days are short, that we take up our rightful place as the body of Jesus and that we shine as the demonstration of His beautiful, complex wisdom to all the powers of darkness as we strive, as we walk in humility and gentleness with one another, patience, bearing one another in love, preserving the unity the Holy Spirit has given us, as we employ the gifts that God has given to the church, both the gifts of the leadership, the gifts of the believers, as we grow up into maturity, as we reject falsehood, as we, as we live and speak truth and love, as we grow up into submission and into greater dependence. It is time to shine. Now listen, in all of this, I understand. I understand better than most. Church, local church is messy. It's not perfect. You go, well, pastor, what you're describing, absolutely I want to belong to that. That's amazing. But in experience, people get crossways and people respond not in love and they get annoyed and, and disunity, little things, little cracks that we allow the enemy to sow. Listen, the local church is messy. Always has been, by the way, if you read most of Paul's letters. But far from discouraging, you and I should take our place with a confident delight. You go, what do you mean? Well, look back up with me. Back in verse 8, Paul quotes from Psalm 68. He says, therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led, captives, a, led a captive, a host of captives. He gave gifts to men. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above the heavens so that he might fill all things. Now, I'll be honest with you. If you do a deep dive on those three verses, you will find more rabbit holes in the, than in the rest of this entire passage we've walked through for three weeks. And we don't have time in, in, in here to go through the rabbit holes. Psalm 68 is a psalm about, about God defeating all his opponents, putting them into captivity and parading them through to demonstrate he's victorious as he comes back to his, his, his temple dwelling place. When Paul quotes that psalm, what Paul is saying is Jesus. Jesus is the one who descended. He descended in the incarnation. He took on flesh. And what was the end result of his incarnation? He won. Not only did he descend in the incarnation, but Peter talks about he descended even into Hades, where there are fallen angels who have been kept in captivity since their fall. And Jesus went down there for the sole purpose of going, I won. Just want to make sure you know in person, I won. And he who descended is also the one who ascended. Well, to ascend means he had to go through the air where the prince of the power of the air, Satan, organizes all his wicked schemes, yet Satan and all his wicked schemes couldn't keep the ascent. And where did Jesus ascend to? He ascended to the right hand of God far above all things. Which simply means this. This is Paul's way of saying that this unity which the Holy Spirit gives which is intended to be preserved and fought for through the diversity of the, 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 the church body, which is then to grow up into maturity. And Jesus has given gifts to make sure that it happens. 
The gifts Jesus gives are the gifts of the almighty victor and nothing can stop them. So yes, the local church is messy. Yes, there are real hurts we may have to work through. Yes, there must be humility to apologize, to forgive. Yes, we'll see all of these things in the weeks to come as Paul fleshes out what the Christian life is to look like. But understand this, there should be a confidence when we step into our place in the body of Jesus. Because The body of Christ is God's beautifully complex, masterfully crafted, brilliant center pleased to the plan of His bringing the kingdom and all things into the alignment of Christ. The solution for the world will never be found. It will never be found in our passion for the Aggies or Longhorns. It will never be found in our passion for various forms of government, the solution to the world is Jesus Christ who is actively chosen to work in victory through his church. May we be about what he is about. And understand this, if all this is true, and you and I will yield ourselves to walk in humility with each other, to walk in gentleness, to be patient, to tolerate one another in love, that we will fight to preserve the unity of the Spirit. Understand this. There are things that God will do to reach our community, Pflugerville, Round Rock, name them all. There are things that God will do that. Understand this. No matter what happens politically throughout the world, nothing will be able to stop what God will do through us because he has ascended on high. Let's pray. Jesus, we look to you. Father, you do not call any one of us to be the superstar of the church. Jesus, you're the superstar of the church. You just call us to be faithful. You call us to be faithful to that gift of mercy you've given some that makes for excellent comforters when others in the body are hurting. Call us to be faithful, to pick up the phone when you bring someone's to mind and to call them and to encourage them for those who you uniquely wired with the gift of encouragement. You've called us to be faithful. Jesus, may we as a church body in these hard days. May we prove more passionate for your will in the church. And for all the other things that we are passionate about. Not because it's all about this church or the church. Jesus, it's all about you. So Father, may we be the unified body you intend for us to be. Jesus, we look to you. May we respond as you are moving, Holy Spirit. It's in your name I pray, Jesus. Amen.